Hello, Jeff. Delighted to be having a second chat with you, myself and Steve Evans here. All right, Jeff. How's it going? Uh, very well, thanks. And I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for having me on again. Couldn't have done Excellent. that badly last time, I guess. No, not at all. Enjoyed right. it. So, yeah, you've been on a busy afternoon with family. Did you go to the <laughs> Legends game yesterday? No, I, I didn't go to that one, although it looked like... Um, it looked like a feisty affair, didn't it? When Gerard scored that penalty, there was <laughs> there was a bit of a bit of afters where he went and celebrated in front of the Celtic fans. So it would have been good to be part of that, to be honest. Uh, yeah, actually, I was hoping you'd be able to tell me more because I didn't go either. I only go to everything, but didn't go, and uh, I heard the same. Yeah, a bit of uh, fireworks with the Celtic fans. Well, obviously, was... his his Rangers connection. Um, yeah, he'd been getting quite a bit of stick off the Celtic supporters all the way through the game, and uh, Liverpool won a penalty, and he didn't shy away from taking it. When he slotted oh. it in, he ran right over to the Celtic end, and there was one or two objects on the pitch. But <laughs> let's just say that, <laughs> uh, but he he, right. he kind of took it. In, he took it in good form, like and um, you know, uh, he, he didn't shy away from it at all. Um, so it shows you that for uh, ninety minutes, there's no such thing as. Uh, Charity, <laughs> at least for ninety minutes. Yeah, a friendly. Yeah, it's always yeah, the same. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did see the penalty when he took it and the way he went over to the crowd. Like I thought, ooh, yeah, but uh, only saw those. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Always the way. Always the way. Yeah. So, just a quick recap uh, before we talk about your writing again and LFC. Uh, are you still working for the NHS? No, I'm no longer at the NHS now. Working um, in higher education. So I work for a university in Liverpool. Oh, um, right. So yeah, kind of in it, you know, still still involved in healthcare. So I'm I'm I work at a me, um, teaching medical students. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I was in the NHS from 1993 until 2020. So I'd done a first ah. stint uh, and kind of just thought it was time to to try something new. No, fair enough, fair enough. So outside your writing, I don't know how you're gonna how you fit anything else in because you do quite a lot as we'll come on to. Do you have any other hobbies? Uh apart from work, family, and <laughs> football, there's very little time for anything. I'm writing, there's very little time I for anything you else. Might say that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't do basket weaving or anything like that. <laughs> You ne- but you but you never know. You never know. Yeah, you know, well, no, there's still time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jeff, you mentioned the uh, Celtic supporters. I'm just thinking between the three of us, it's safe to say that we won't be supporting any Blues at elections or a local derby match. Well, why do you think it is that Liverpool, along with the vast majority of Scotland, are Tory free? Um, I suppose... Uh... I mean, a Marxist analysis of that would say the conditions determine consciousness, don't they? And I think if you look at life for most people growing up, not just Liverpool and Scotland, but the north of England, yeah. um, you know, it doesn't lend itself to a ready support base for that type of ideology, does it? And, um, you know, particularly in Liverpool over the last... I mean, it's worth noting, of course, that... You know, as late as the late 1970s, there were conservative councillors on Liverpool City Council. I think we had MPs. Uh, But sort of post-1979, the the trajectory has been towards the left. And um, I I think that's down to the kind of lived experience of the people in those places. Um, And, you know, we've we've seen firsthand, really, uh, the contempt, in my view. Uh, that that party in this government holds for the north of England and places like Liverpool. Uh, so it doesn't surprise me in the slightest that they they get no votes or hardly yeah. any votes in this region. Well, it's common knowledge that Thatcher left Liverpool to decline, managed decline. I think the term was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a um, that was a, a letter written to Thatcher by I think it was by um, Geoffrey Howe, mm. who was a cabinet member at the time, and, and essentially I think what he was. What he was expressing was the, um, essentially the, the the fact that that wing of the Conservative Party had run out of ideas in terms of you know how to re- how to um, provide support or create any kind of level playing field for the North of England, yeah. um, and also the contempt in which 
they held Liverpool and Liverpool politicians and Liverpool people at the time. Liverpool people were seen as as militants, as um, you know, the trade unions were famously the first out and the last back. Uh, and I see that obviously as a sign of their solidarity and their willingness to fight and not lie down. Yeah. Uh, but to the Tories, that was seen as a sign of militancy. Thatcher described as an enemy within. Yeah. Um, and I think they kind of ran out of ideas. They they decided we're never going to win these people back. So it's better to disperse the population, to, which is what Howe said in his letter. Mm. Allow the population to disperse to the regions outside of Liverpool and let Liverpool rot, essentially. Yeah. Um, many of us felt that, I mean, you will have, you will have felt this as well. Seven many seasons. of us felt yeah. in, in Liverpool that that's exactly how they felt about us. Yeah. We knew that's how they felt about us. But when we saw that in black and white, when it was released under the 30-year 30, 30 rule, it just confirmed what we already knew. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's been a catalogue of things since then, hasn't there? Hillsborough being one of them yeah, yeah. that's really cemented that in in the in the, the consciousness and the psyche uh, of Liverpool people, I think. Yeah. Uh, just sticking with that era back in the 90s now more so, um, you had a bit of an incident, didn't you, back in the day with uh, Maggie Thatcher? Do you want to just tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah, I think that was, it might have been earlier than that. I think it was sort of mid to late 80s. Thatcher came to Liverpool on a on a secret visit. Um, and she oh, came yeah. to visit That's the... the uh, she came yeah, right. To, it was 80s. Yeah, she, she, she came to visit that, the, the Eldonian estate right. in the Vauxhall Road area of the city. And, and somehow I was involved with the... Um, Became very politically active, more more so after I left school. Really, I left school into kind of mass unemployment, and my my reaction to that was to get very angry. and um, And I became involved in an organisation called the Trade Union and Unemployment Resource Centre, which is you know where the flying picket is on Harman Street. Yeah, yeah. So there's a big building. It's a restaurant now, um, but that kind of was housed kind of you know activists, trade unionists, and things like that. I became involved with them. They got tipped off somehow by a local journalist that Thatcher was visiting the Eldonian estate. So a, a sort of ad hoc process was was pulled together and we all went down there and um, we all tried to block the road and stop our car getting into the estate and um, <laughs> were promptly picked up by the police and bundled into the back of a van. And I think the, the guy who, the sergeant who, who came in, I thought we were going to get beaten up or filled in, but the sergeant come in and he said, um, I don't think he could be bothered with the paperwork, uh, but he kind of gave us a stern warning and let us go. Um, but yeah, uh, there was a there was a big protest there, and um, the police were quite heavy handed, to be honest with you, for for what was a peaceful protest um, at the end of the day. But I think it said a lot that she had to come in and out of Liverpool in secret and you know uh, heavy police presence. And I think that that said a lot. I remember at the time as a young a young fella that you know being probably 18, 17, 18, being hugely disappointed that I wasn't um, I wasn't arrested and charged because I wanted it to be, at the time in my head, I wanted there to be a lot of publicity about arrests at, the, yeah. at Thatcher's visit to Liverpool. I didn't want her to be able to come in and out without so much as a whimper. I wanted there to be huge publicity around it. Um, obviously now I'm probably... With hindsight, glad I wasn't charged. <laughs> um, but well, back in the day, I was uh, I was really annoyed. <laughs> well, I, I thought the police would have been a little bit more sympathetic to the cause, especially police in Liverpool, because mm. they were aware of the whole situation with Liverpool and the Conservatives. So, you know, I'm surprised that they they had a heavy handed approach. Well, I suppose I'm saying that I, I felt we were all you know pretty much manhandled and dragged off the off the streets yeah. and bundled into the back of the van. But I suppose the sympathy came in uh, allowing us to go with a stern warning yeah. as opposed yeah. to getting filled yeah. in in the back yeah. of the van, which yeah. is what I yeah. feared might happen. Yeah. True yeah. enough, true enough. <laughs> yeah. At the time as well as the IRA, you know, their, what should we call it, their campaign was sort of running as well. So that would have added to the police presence. But you mentioned the Eldonian. Well, and I think for me, that's the legacy of the militant, the so-called militant, the Derek Hatton era. I remember reading in Derek Hatton's book, um, Maggie Thatcher, she came to see the then Labour Council, uh, I think in the town hall, and he said to all the local councillors present, do not stand up when she walks in. We've got no respect for this lady. Sit down. I mean, that. I mean that he was, in, in, in saying that for me, he was speaking on behalf of, yes. 
you know, the people of Liverpool, people like young people like me at the time, you know, uh, had nothing but. Um, I, I'll be, I'll be honest. I, you know, had nothing but contempt for her and the party that she she led, and and I, I believe the feeling was mutual. Yeah. Uh, a funny story about in relation to your, your comment, your observation about the IRA campaign going on. In, in the van that we all piled into to drive down to Vauxhall Road for the demonstration was a driving that van was a, a guy with a strong Irish accent, strong Northern <laughs> Irish accent. Yeah. Yeah. And we couldn't find it. We couldn't find you couldn't find the uh, the Eldonian estate. Yeah. And we noticed there was police everywhere and there was a, a, a copper on, on a set of traffic lights and we thought yeah. well, it must be around here somewhere. Yeah. There's such a heavy police presence. Uh, and so he pulls up <laughs> Winds his wind, and I'm not going to do the accent because I wouldn't want to insult the great people of uh, Northern Ireland. But, uh, he says, "Can you, in this really strong Northern Irish accent, can you tell me where Margaret Thatcher's going?" Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> and this copper, this copper just looked at him. We all burst out laughing in the van. This copper just looks at him and says, "Are you taking the piss?" No. <laughs> uh, yeah, no. I mean, yeah. all of that, you know, that protest and anger. Yeah. There was, there was quite a lot of humour as well. Mm, yeah. Okay. Now, so moving on, we talk about your writing. I think last time we, we talked, there's six books out so far. Yes, there is. Yeah. Yeah. Should, should, should we have a brief chat about all of them, maybe just briefly, and then move on to uh, what new yeah, writing that you're yeah, working I'm, on? I'm more than happy. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, good. Good. Um, so the first one, should we talk about Red Odyssey, 2018? Yeah. yeah so so Red Odyssey came. That's the first book. Um. And that that came out uh, to coincide with 125 years um, of of Liverpool Football Club. Essentially, that was the yep. the you know the anniversary yep. of the creation of Liverpool Football Club. So we came up with this idea of um, actually in conversation with Matt Ladson, who's the editor of of This Is Anfield, about you know creating 125 stories. Yeah. But you know, to coincide with 125 yeah, years. Um, so yeah, that that book is essentially a love letter to Liverpool Football Club, and it's okay. kind of each chapter is is a kind of story from the history of the club, dating from 1892, and it goes all the way up to 2017. Yeah. Um, so it captures everything, you know, the the ups, the downs, yeah. um, you know, the heroes, the villains, the disasters, and and you know everything, everything in between. Uh, so that was kind of a Herculean effort, and kind of doing that made me realise that one, I loved writing, but uh, but two, I had the stamina. Um, because the thing about writing is, you know, you can, writing an article is 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 a skill and a challenge, but mm. writing something on the scale of Red Odyssey, keeping the reader's attention for that many pages, um, you know, something I wasn't sure what I could do, but that kind of made meant that I. I was confident and and I started the ball rolling really. Okay, okay. And the second book that was Stanley Park Story. Yeah, so I, so I'd had Stanley Park Story in the bank, as it were. Really, I'd, I'd written partially written that one hmm. uh, a while ago. It was very different than the finished product. Uh, but but my feeling was after getting read, obviously published, it was probably better to strike while the iron was hot and uh-huh. cash in on. Um, sort of the, the credibility that I'd, I'd achieved with Red Odyssey and pitched Stanley Park Story straight away. Um, now, the, the challenge with Stanley Park Story, I think, is it's it's sort of quite different. Well, it's it's completely different from any other book I've written, and it's quite different to a lot of books out there on the market in that it's, it's a mixture of fact, history, biography, yeah. and uh, fiction, complete fiction. Uh, okay. So what I've done is I've weaved the... A, a fictional story throughout the history of the Merseyside Derby from 1963 through to through to 2017. Uh, so it's a novel, essentially a historical novel. Yeah. Um, and I was pitched. Probably, it's fair to say, needed a bit of convincing. Yeah. Um, and sort of want and, and and wanted to see some chapters and a synopsis and stuff like that. So, um, and I've had conversations with we pitched since and they've said, you know, they were a little bit sceptical, but because Red Odyssey had done well, they decided to give it a go and yeah. were very pleased with it in the end and kind of liking it to, I mean, I'm not suggesting it's, you know, I'm not comparing myself to writers like this, but in, in terms of the structure and the style of the book, it's probably like 
you know, Red or Dead or, oh yeah, um, you know, those, those type of books in that yeah. it's a fictional story yeah, set yeah. against a, a genuine historical backdrop. I love the sound of it. Oh, the Untouchables. Well, yeah. I've read the Untouchables and uh, the Lost Shankly Boy because I know George Scott quite well anyway, and I was at that launch you did in the uh, oh, yeah. same pub in Anfield Road anyway. Um, yeah. In the hotel, wasn't it? In oh, Taggy's Bar. Taggies, that was it. Taggies. Yeah. yeah. It was there that night. It was a well attended night, wasn't it? It was good. And uh oh, it was a fantastic night. Yeah. yeah, it was brilliant. I brought my books along and got George to sign it and you and, and Kieran and as you do, you know, and you you probably don't even remember <laughs> seeing me because there were so many people there. I mean Alan Kennedy was there, as you know, and that's uh, right, yeah. George Sefton dropped by. Uh, a few others as well. It was yeah. Uh, Mark Platt was there from LFC TV, wasn't he? And uh, yeah, uh, Karen Gill Shankly's granddaughter was there. That's yeah, no, right. that was a, That's right. It was a brilliant yeah. night. Yeah, it was a good night. Yeah, so they've been a uh, pretty successful. I mean, George keeps sharing it on Facebook. It's in the top ten of this, or it's on a bookshelf here with all these books. So they've been pretty good, haven't they? Those pair of books. Yeah, yeah, and and in many ways, you know. Um, George's book was a joy, um, it, and because actually it's just an incredible story. Um, it's almost I've I've spoken to many people about this and said you know it's almost like a a, a classic hero's tale. You know, you think of Luke Luke and Luke and Obi Wan in Star Wars <laughs> and Frodo and Gandalf in Lord of the Rings, and you know it's it's that kind of young boy faced with tragedy early in his life going on a journey from, you know, this small town in Aberdeen to Liverpool where he meets this charismatic, mesmeric figure like Shankly, who completely, it's fair to say, changes his life, even though yeah. he never broke in to the Liverpool first team. It's fair to say that Shankly has guided George's life ever since, you know, and, um, you know, that, that well, as soon as I sat, I went to meet George to um, with the view to doing an interview, to just, just producing an article for for this is Anfield, and I spent like 20 minutes talking to him and thought there's more than an article here. Uh, and that's how that book came about. The Untouchables is a bit different in that um, I've always had a fascination for that period of the club's history. Um, yeah, that was, yeah, yeah, going back in the day, wasn't it? Yeah, a good few yeah, years. Yeah, and, and, and thought, yeah. sort of thought that, you know, we all celebrate rightly so the Shankly era and post Shankly era. And we see Shankly as being the kind of, father of modern Liverpool, but it's it and that is right and true, but it's not fair to assume there was nothing before Shankly. Um, you know, that team in the twenties coming out of World War One were just packed with unbelievable figures and characters. There's no more mercurial and eccentric manager in Liverpool's history than Dave Ashworth, who led them to the first title and spectacularly quit halfway through the second title to go back to his old club Oldham who were fighting a relegation battle to try and save them from relegation. Um, you know, it's just a fascinating period. And then you've got World War One in the mix there. Many of the players had fought. And they came out of World War One, and they were in a pandemic. So they were in the Spanish flu pan, so-called Spanish flu pandemic. Uh, so it's just, just unbelievable stories. And um, little known to me, Kieran had been, you know, researching and was interested in, in that at the same time and we ended up having a chat and it turned out we both had similar interests and decided to uh to have a go we wrote that book during the pandemic we never met each other until afterwards yeah um and we wrote it via email zoom phone calls the first time we met was in richard's book in crosby when we were doing a signing <laughs> That's amazing, met in person. yeah absolutely uh, amazing you can't meet yet you've got a similar yeah 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 great yeah yeah and it's also quite um, – imagine these days if George Scott was in that similar position back in the 60s when he was trying to break in. He would have been in the squad, off the bench all the time. He would have played in the first team. He'd have been a regular household name, you know. But because he was like the 12th man and he couldn't quite get into the team, he was always winning the reserves, as we know, you know, the reserve league all of the time. And it just couldn't break through at the time. But these days, no. you know, squad player. No, heartbreaking for him, and, and I think yeah. you're right. I think you know when the in the sort of seventies, he's broken in in the seventies. He's probably got games. He was top scorer in the reserves. That's he right. just had a team full of full of international world class players ahead of him, and he was relying on one of them. 
getting injured, and of course, famously, they hardly ever did. That's it. Used to play the same eleven uh, if they had a knock. Yeah. They just played along with it, didn't they? Not like these days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jeff, you mentioned that it's a Stanley Park story. That's partly fiction. You also mentioned on your website, uh, jeffgill.com, that your ambitions as a fiction writer and, and oh, the yeah. horror genre. Have you been doing any work on that? Any updates? Yeah. So, I mean, that was my ambition has always been, ever since I was at school, my ambition was to write. I always wanted to be a writer. Yeah. Didn't really think that people like me became writers, but I was a huge fan of Stephen <laughs> King and James Herbert. Yeah. Um, and just fell in love in particular with the way Stephen King wrote. Um, and his books were horror, but they were about real people yeah, yeah. in a real context, do you know yeah. what I mean? And yeah. quite often the, the monsters in King's books are people you identify with yeah. in your whole yeah. life. They're bullies. Bullies feature mm. extensively in King's books, don't they? And um, so, yeah, so I always wanted to write horror fiction and, and did have a go. And funnily enough, I, I was looking through some old files um, uh, only recently, really, and came across 20 short stories that, that I've written. Uh, that's, a, that's a book now, full. Now, so, so, some, of them are, some of them are horrific and not yeah. for, you know, some of them are horrific <laughs> for the quality of the writing. Yeah. Um, but it, it kind of, I've reading through them and I kind of, even the ones I thought were horrific, I thought, you know, well, actually there's a, there's a germ of an idea in here. And obviously I wrote that a long time ago before yeah. I kind of developed any kind of writing style. So I'm, I'm currently in the process of putting together an anthology right. um, of, of short fiction, um, which is in the horror genre or dark fiction genre. Yeah. Um, but yeah, ultimately I think that's, that's something I want to do is I, I want to write, um, I, I want to get into writing fiction. Would that would you send that to the same publisher as the sports books pitch? No, I think I think it'd be yeah. I talk, so they're very specifically yeah, set yeah. up yeah. Uh, with the insight and the knowledge and the understanding of the sports book market. Yeah. Uh, it's very challenging to get fiction published. Uh, yeah, I yeah, think yeah. Um, there's always the self-publishing route. This is the indie route. Self-publishing route open. is an option yeah. without a doubt. Yeah. And that's what I would do. I'd have no qualms about doing that because to me, um, you know, writing the books has never been about, you know, trying to, it's not been a, it's not been my, you know, I've got a day job, so it's not yeah, my yeah, main yeah. source of income and it's not, it's not about fame and fortune or anything like that. It's just about expression, isn't it? It's about yeah, a way of, yeah. um, you know, getting what's inside out for other people to, you know, in, in a medium that I feel comfortable expressing myself, which is in, in writing. And I, I kind of find, um, I'm much more able to do that in, in writing that often more often than I am verbally, to be honest with you. Um, yeah. I can find ways of of expressing myself through through word through words on on a screen or a page yeah. far more easy than I do, you know, in person. And it gets back as well, sort of in a circular way. Uh, we were talking about people from Liverpool, and we mentioned people in Scotland. We won't stand idly by. We won't keep silent. We will express ourselves. We're not afraid to do that. I think people from from Liverpool, traditionally, you know, we will speak up. Yeah, I I, I agree completely. I think I think there's, I think yeah. So I would say the on the whole, I think that's a common characteristic in our cities. You know, if you look at the likes of Glasgow, you look yeah, at yeah, Liverpool, yeah. to an extent yeah. Manchester, other yeah. areas in the north of England, parts of London. Um, you know, you have a people who are quite defiant and who, who um, you know, I, I, fe my, my mum used to say to me all the time, you know, never, never believe what you read in the papers, never trust what you see on the news, yeah. think for yourself, ask questions, yeah. always challenge what people say to you. Yeah. That was kind of part of my, you know, psyche growing up, really, and that comes from my mum. Yeah. Uh, my dad was a trade unionist; he was exactly the same, you know, very skeptical. Yeah. Um, anti-establishment uh, to to a large extent, um, but I think we've reached a point in society now where there's been a complete collapse of faith in in the system and authority and authority figures, and that can go one of two ways, can't it? So it can manifest itself in the kind of radical left or it can manifest itself on the radical right. And I think that's the kind of 
worrying, scary split yeah. that we currently have in our society at the moment in that even in Liverpool, I worry that there's a danger that we're, where there's a political vacuum and no one offering a credible alternative, yeah. that these Extremist figures stepping. on the right can yeah. step in yeah. with these kind of conspiracy theories and, and all of that and kind of mop up that dis, disaffection and, mm. and anger. Uh, well, and let's face it, you know, I'm, you know, the reason these conspiracy theories flourish is because there is evidence that the state have behaved in an abominable way yeah. towards its people over the years. So it's easy for people, particularly in areas like ours, mm. to buy into the more extreme conspiracy theories. So I think it's a crisis of critical thinking that we've got and the kind of way you've got these pockets of real anger and disaffection. You know, it is it is worrying to me. Um and I'm constantly getting, you know, told off by family for, for constantly saying, you know, where's the source for that? You know, where have you read that? You know, when my kids yeah. come to me with things, yeah. you know, why should we trust these people? You know, I think we just, I think that's what we, I, I feel very strongly that there's a real danger that unless we kind of give the working class a real uh, ability to think critically um, then there's a real danger that some shady figures could come up and take advantage of the genuine and um, noble rage that there is out there in society at what's happening around us. Yeah. I hope yeah. that didn't sound like a rant, but no, I, feel I, very I, strongly I, about I, it. I think it was actually spot on. I totally agree with every word yeah. of that, Jeff. Very well put. Yeah. Come back to Jeremy Corbyn and his era when he was really pushing to be PM, wasn't he, at one point? Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you think um, he was intentionally smeared by his own party and the med mass media to stop him becoming a PM, like, like a socialist PM? I mean, it, it almost feels like, you know, imp it's impossible to deny, in my view, that, that there was a campaign of vilification uh, against Jeremy Corbyn, not just Jeremy Corbyn, to be fair, his supporters. Yeah. Um, and, you know, amongst the mass movement of... 600,000, 800,000 people, I suppose 600,000 people joined the Labour Party, didn't they? Or there was 600,000 members um, at the height of the, the Corbyn uh, phenomena. Uh, amongst that mass movement, the the, the national press um, and his opponents were always going to be able to seize upon individuals who maybe, you know, were saying things and doing things that we, yeah. you and I wouldn't, wouldn't agree with. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's undeniable that sections of the of the Labour Party um, and certainly the print and broadcast media mounted what, in my view, is is unprecedented, uh, unprecedented campaign against one one man. And I think a lot of us kind of rallied around Jeremy because we could see someone who believed in what we believed in getting a kicking, yeah. and it's it's almost a natural thing for us, isn't it? And, to sort of want to stand shoulder to shoulder when someone's getting, you know, when, it's, when there's not a fair fight. Yeah, yeah. You want to support them. But I think we'd be mistaken if we kind of focused entirely on Jeremy because as he himself would say, it wasn't really him they were scared of. It was the ideas he was putting yeah, forward. Yeah, the it was the policy. Because the policies he was putting forward would have meant that the, the people who are... Uh, siphoning off the country's wealth right now would have been held to account. Yeah. Um, and so, yes, I think there was a massive campaign. Unfortunately, it was successful. Mm. Um, and the left is now in retreat within the party. So it's kind of what happens to that movement now. Where does it go? How does it refocus? I've seen some evidence it's kind of coalesced around the trade union movement and the wave of strikes that we've yeah. seen and people like Mick Lynch have risen mm -hmm. to the fore, incredibly articulate, yeah. incredibly difficult for the media to to get one over on him. He's absolutely perfect, isn't yeah. he, on he camera? Is. And, and, yeah. um, so hopefully we see some kind of something emerge again mm -hmm. um, because I think there is a great deal of discontent with the current Labour Party and many people will probably vote Labour in the next election because... They hate the Tories, but not because they believe in its agenda or its policy platform, in my view.
I totally yeah, agree. absolutely spot on. I totally, yeah, totally agree. Totally yeah. agree. Yeah. yeah. I was just want to ask you about the fanzines. Still, this is Anfield, Liverpool. Where you're still doing those? Still uh, dedicated? Yeah, yeah. Anfield? No, absolutely. Um, whenever I can, I have to say I'm working on a couple of projects now. One with Kieran, um, and I'm working on another edition of the Red Od- Red Odyssey tr- um, series. Yeah. Uh, so the time I've got to write for other outlets has become quite challenging. Uh, but yeah, still, still big supporter of online fan content and fanzine content, and will always be. So I'll always continue to contribute to those in whatever way I can. Yeah, your website's still looking great, though. I was yeah. having a look at it before. <laughs> and I do like it the way you've laid it out and some of the stuff that's that hits you as soon as you open it. It's great. <laughs> oh, thanks very much, Steve. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Uh, Jeff, I had that time scored up with us. Can we book another shot maybe in another few months' time? With a new of course, book? Of course, anytime. Yeah. I'll, I'll come on anytime you like. Not a problem. At nice one. I, I totally agree with everything you've said there. Spot on. Very well put, yeah. I think. It is. Yeah, it was good to touch on, well, just to touch on the 80s and the 90s what? and what the stories were up to. Uh, you know, because we did uh, touch on your books a lot last time, but it was also good as a refresher. So definitely yeah. brilliant. Yeah. yeah, thanks very much again. For that, yeah. Oh, All right. well, you're more than welcome, guys. Lovely to see you. Cheers, Jeff. Keep in touch, mate. Yeah. Brilliant. Will do. Speak to you soon. Ta. Ta-ra now. Ta-ra. Yo.